For the first time ever in all the years of knitting, it made me laugh when you said tight knitter. Dan's looking at a blackbird down there outside. I imagined a knitting group that met at a coffee shop. It looks like Ribena currently. But there's one knitter who never <laughs> buys the drinks. And everyone always says, oh, she's such a tight knitter, that Gladys. <laughs> you just said it looked like Ribena currently. <laughs> The rules are, there ain't no the, rules. No, so I mean... Name the film. So 85% superwash merino, 20... That doesn't add up to 100. Why do I always have problems? Yeah, Put on so your Christmas hats. I know. Jingle your bells. <laughs> pull a cracker. <laughs> All right. And get knitting. <laughs> oh, that's yummy, that, isn't it? Isn't it lovely? Yeah, your husband might just walk into the room and you just like suddenly say to them, Stop so festive the merriment! <laughs> and they'll be like, oh. What? Yeah, Dan started weight. He's got some muscles on his arms. It's very nice. <laughs> Carry on. Welcome, everybody, to the Bakery Bears video show featuring my favourite colourways. Yay! Now you join us in a show filled with summer festive merriment. That's not a sentence I've ever said summer before. Summer festive merriment? Yes. That and should be a new something. thing, shouldn't it? It should be. It should be. Yeah. I know. I know. I'm pleased with that. Hashtag yeah. summer festive merriment. I can't, can't even say, say it. it. It's gone now. It's gone. <laughs> Yes, this is a show filled with summer festive merriment, and I'm going to tell you for why, because we are slap bang in the heart of our summer of stitching. We are. And whilst we have been holding lovely events since May yeah. for our Baker Bear patrons, today everything changes. Today... Oh, I had to take that moment. Yes. Today, everything changes but you. Yes. We're a thousand miles apart, <laughs> but you know I love you. Oh, that's a bit much, isn't it? But it's all true. You love everybody out there. Of course I do. Yes. They're all marvellous. Well, of course you are. Yes. yes, today everything changes because it is the crown jewel. We have two crown jewels sat in the heart of the ring that is our summer of stitching. The first one is the Christmas in July, Cal, that begins yes. today. Today is the 1st of July. Open to the world. Yes, everybody can join in. Put on so. your Christmas hats. I know. Jingle your bells. <laughs> pull a cracker. Okay. All right. And get knitting. <laughs> I'm going to do all of that. Or crocheting. Oh, I wish I'd got some crackers now. Oh, now. <laughs> now you're talking. I know. Look, we all make this mistake. It gets to December and we've got no presents for anybody. Yeah. And the best thing about Christmas in July, and it's the first time I've ever done it, is what better way to get a head start on arguably yeah. the most wonderful time of the year yeah. and have some Christmas presents ready to go. Absolutely. But also, if you get all your Christmas presents knitted in Christmas in July, if you're a fast knitter, why don't you knit yourself a present for now? You could, can you? Yeah. Make your actual Christmas in July. Yes. <laughs> Pick a day and celebrate, baby. 25th of July it should be a suppose, shouldn't it? Yes. If you're going to do that. Most definitely. Yeah. It's so exciting. And as I've said, and you know, as we've said a few times now, but just so everyone is completely aware, you can all come and join in. You can. How do they do that, Kate? Right, so there's a thread open on Ravelry if you would like to join in. If you don't use Ravelry, then you can always email us with your entry. You know, towards the end of July, do that, you know, because presumably you'll want to work on it up until then. But if you want to enter that way, and you, you know, you don't use Ravelry, then by all means, you're very welcome to email us with your entry and we will add it in. But yes, there's a thread open on Ravelry and it gives you full details. There's really not a lot of rules as such. We don't go in for rules with knit-alongs. The rules are, um, there ain't no the, rules. No, so I mean... Name you, the you, film. I know it. The rules are, there ain't... I, I do know it, tell me. We're it, playing for pinks. Oh, pinks? it's Greece, yes. Greece, Greece. <laughs> yes, so no, you can knit anything you want, obviously. You know, knit any, anything you want. It doesn't have to be festive themed as such. It can be absolutely anything. But, you know, ideally it should be something that you're going to either keep for yourself for Christmas or you're going to give as a gift, like Dan said. 
but you can knit whatever you want. I mean, it would be lovely if it was festive themed because that's really nice to look at, isn't it? And I think it it gives you that sort of Christmas in July feeling. Um, you don't have to finish your item. If you don't get it done, that's fine. Then, you know, just enter it towards the end of July whenever you want to do that. You can knit more, more than one thing. You can have multiple entries. So if you knit five pairs of socks, wow, can you imagine that? Or five hats or whatever, you can have five entries, that's absolutely fine. So I'm only opening one thread, this is what I tend to do these days, and you can chat it in there and you can put your entries in there and I will just draw from the whole thing. Because my theory is if you are in there and you are chattering about it, then you are taking part. So that's absolutely fine. And then the prize for this knit along is a set of minis that yeah. I've dyed up in the colours that I used for my tinsel socks, which I launched last time. So it's the exact same minis that I use. So that will be the prize and we will draw the prize, you know, the first show after the end of July, whenever that falls. Oh, festive treats don't just end there in this show. Oh no, because what do you need to really sort of get yourself into the swing of things for a festive knit along. You need the perfect skein oh, of yes. festive yarn. And that's what Kay's gonna bring you today yes. in my favorite colorways. Yes, it's a gorgeous festive, just the most sort of, the best bit is though, the worst, I think, the worst type of festive yarns are the, are the, the, the type that scream Christmas because then you can only wear them at Christmas. Yeah, this, Otherwise you look yeah. a bit nutty. <laughs> So this is subtly Christmas. Yes. If you're going to do something, do it subtly. Yeah. Don't scream it, because then it's just, it's all a bit too much. So yes, <laughs> this is a subtle skein of gorgeous yes. Christmas festive yarn, but also with a freestyled coordinating colour. Coordinating colour, colour. yeah. And Amazing. I've, I've also, this time, I've also knitted it up so you can see what it looks like knitted up, but I've also crocheted it up. Amazing, amazing. So you can see what it looks like in crochet and it's fabulous. And folks, don't fall off your chair because for the first time in as long as I can remember, there is an additional lovely segment in today's show. Oh yes. We promised you we would bring you a snippet from the making of Walking the Wall. And that's coming up for you today, in today's show as well. Yeah. It's actually, it's already available, the full show. It's a 30 minute documentary on yeah. the making of Walking the Wall and it went live to our Bakery Bear patrons on the 28th of June. People are just absolutely Brilliant. loving it. So that's all really thanks to, I wasn't sure what people would think, but I showed it to Kay. Yeah. was like, oh my goodness. I loved it. This yeah, is marvelous. It's amazing. So yeah. when I say snippet, sometimes people say a snippet and it's like 30 seconds, isn't this it? Is, oh, this no. is like, no. I don't know what you'd call it. It's not a snippet. No, it's seven minutes. It's like, uh, I don't know. Seven minutes it's is not a snippet. It's a very glamorous yes. snippet is yes. what it is. The best type of snippet. Yes. Yes. We like a glamorous snippet. We do. Yes. Has to be glamorous. Summer it? festive merriment. I'm all I'm all a fluster with I this know. new phrase. I know. I mean, I wonder how, what we could do with it. Summer festive merriment. Yes. You've all got to use that within, in a sentence. With, yes, today. in a sentence. Sometime within July. Let's not yes. say today. No, no. Yeah. People might not have the opportunity today. You we know? could have summer festive merriment bingo. Yeah, your husband might just walk into the room and you just like suddenly say to them, Summer, summer festive, festive merriment, <laughs> and they'll be like, what? what? Or your wife, of course. There is nothing or that partner. could put a smile on your face more. Or I mean, child or dog. I mean, good for you, Kay. You're being very modern. <laughs> Covering absolutely all the possible bases. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Folks, look, this is a show and a half today. It really is. We've got so many wonderful projects to show you. And I've got two new things to show you Amazing. today. Amazing. So I think, so that's exciting. without further ado, because I'm now excited because I'm not even sure what the two new things are. Ah. Let's, are you showing us anything first? Yes. Ooh, in that case, I shall not. New thing alert. Yes, new thing alert. We need a siren. We do. We need a little like. Kate Jones, what's on your needles? So, the first thing in a very old bag that I made myself oh, years ago, but I love it. It's, it's such a simple little bag. I used this fabric. I was so excited when I found this fabric and I made a load of bags to sell. So some of you out there might have a bag in this fabric. And I just loved it that much that I, I tracked it down. I think I might have even had to get it somewhere from Europe. 
but I got a big amount of it, all I could find. This is um, the Rome stuff. It's the Rome stuff. Kay made these to coincide yeah. with our first ever proper filming on Hadrian's Wall in our yeah. favourite places to knit series. Yeah, yeah I did. And I did. when we put out those episodes, you put those bags up for sale. I did, I did. And wasn't there also There was a like cool... a coin, a Roman coin yeah. on the pull, on the zipper pull. Goodness me. Yeah, but I made If myself, anyone's got one of those bags... I know. Post a picture on Instagram. Absolutely, and yeah, in. do, do. But I made myself... This is the fabric look. Oh, isn't it? I just love it so much. Can you see the Vatican there? You know, we love Rome so much. We absolutely love it. And it couldn't be more appropriate, could it? Slap bang in the middle of the filming and, and you know, walking the wall. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I pulled this out and it's such a simple little bag. It's not even lined. I didn't even line it with anything. It's just a drawstring bag. When I say I didn't line it, um, I, there is lining in it, just a plain lining. I mean, I didn't interface it is what I meant. I usually use the fusible fleece. It's a violin, or I've I think they've changed their name now to something like v Visaline or something. And I use, I think it's H. What? Vi it, Visaline? Yeah. Surely not. Well, that's very similar to Vaseline, I know it is, but it's not... That's it's, insane. It's, I think it's the same word, but with an I, what Vaseline. Were they thinking? I know. They always were Vaseline, and that's what I, I knew the most. But the last couple of times I've ordered it, it says Vaseline stroke Vaseline. I don't, I don't know. And I think it's H... It's either H640 or H630 that I use, and it's the fusible one. It's quite thick, and I really love using that. It's, you know, it's what... Is in like this one, can't tell, but it sort of makes it feel squishy and padded. But for this one, I didn't do that. It's just got the outer fabric and it's just got the lining fabric, which is a plain cream. It's a perfect little bag and I really like it for on the go knitting because there's no interfacing, it just sort of scrunches down it really nicely. And it kind of matched the colors, kind of match what's in here. Now in here I've got... What colour is it? It's this colour. Oh, well of course it is. I'm such an idiot. You just said the colours kind of match what's in here. Yeah, look. I think I was fascinated to see, because you could go in so many different directions. It could have been slightly green, a bit red. Yeah, well that's true. No, it's like, blue. it's the sort of overall beigey sort of colour, I guess, neutrally. Or I was so. driving our daughter to school, actually end of an era. She's finished. We used to have a, a, a child who was in uniformed school. Now, in many parts of the world, the uniform school uniform. doesn't even exist. It doesn't exist, yeah. I've got to say, I am a firm believer in so uniform I. school. Absolutely a stalwart believer in uniform school, yeah. But actually, those days for us are over. They are. <laughs> Which is a bit weird. Yes, her GCSEs are finished. Finished. And she's now, she's actually worked a couple of days with as us. an office junior. She has. She did a very good job. She did a very good yes, job. very she, impressed. She cleared out about... 45,000 emails. Yeah. Yes. I've still, Not from don't, mine. Don't even. I've still got a lot, but it's much less than it was. Look, and I don't want people to think that it, my job, I'm the, I'm the customer facing person. Oh, it's not those types no, of no, emails. No, no, don't worry. If you message us, you oh, will no, get no, a reply. No, 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 not those types of emails at all. This is horrible, pointless yeah. mail drops that you get from crazy companies. Yeah. So she was brilliant. She was setting up she rules was. so that they great. automatically got blocked and deleted and yeah, it's like oh yeah. youths they're marvellous she was brilliant and we paid her so but she's got some money now and the it. whole reason why I brought this up is on one of her final days when I was driving her in for one of her exams we drove past the guy he could not have been more beige really oh my goodness beige hat right. beige jacket oh, no. beige trousers and <laughs> yes beige shoes was he an older man I would say late 50s, oh, so really? no. Oh, really? Gosh, yeah. not yes. at all then. I said... Oh, somebody needs to take him aside. Well, I said, I said to Bronnie, can you have too much beige? Yes. And she said, yes, yes, yeah. you can, yes. Too much of a good thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely. But there's definitely not too much of a good thing with this project. So I've got this yarn, and I'll tell you about the yarn in a minute. But I decided to knit some fingerless mitts with this yarn because I loved the yarn so much I wanted to be able to see it on my hands. And I was thinking I'd do full mittens, but I thought about it and I thought, you know what, I actually 
more often than not, if I'm if I need something on my hands, I will wear fingerless mitts unless it's really freezing. Because then I've, I've got my, you know, you've got your fingertips out, haven't you? And you can change your music or take a photo or whatever when I'm out walking. So I decided to knit fingerless mitts and I decided to use a little stitch pattern on it that I've actually used before in a pair of socks. But I loved it so much I wanted to use it in something else. So I'll show you the mitt first. I've just, I've almost finished the first one. And then I'll tell you about the yarn and tell you about the stitch pattern. So here's the lovely mitt. And can you see that sweet little stitch pattern on it? It's so pretty and so, oh, it's so universal as well. I love this little stitch pattern and it's so nice to, to knit. And then the back is just plain, but look at the speckles. Oh my goodness, this yarn. Look at the speckles. Isn't it pretty? So where's that yarn from again? Well, this is actually a skein of yarn that I dyed. When? Well, it's some years ago. It's, What's the colourway? It's probably four, four years, maybe more ago. I, I couldn't even say. The colourway, I only ever dyed two skeins of this yarn. Oh. Yeah. It was never for sale or anything like that. I just dyed two skeins and they were both out of my possession. And this one, miraculously, has found its way back to me. So I was absolutely thrilled and I just wanted to knit it because it's just so pretty. But I gave it the name of Flopsy Mopsy and Cottontail, lovely rabbity term. And it's just a really lightly speckled. I seem to remember, I did write it down what I did with this. I did because I found it, but I'm pretty sure I only used two dye colours. But it's just so lovely. And I, it's a sparkle base I dyed it up on. Oh, can you see the... Gorgeous little speckles. It really, I mean... It's so lovely. It is a, a reflection of the fact that we've only been talking recently about how less is more. Less, less is more. I mean, yes, it's, it's amazing, really, what, yeah, what you, you could You should produce. only... How often do we see in the modern world, it's like, wow! Yeah. It's like everything, everything, everything. There's like the, the subtlety... And you know, the, and that's where the art comes in, doesn't it? Yeah. I yeah, think anyone I, can take a million, you know, different colours and make something that looks eclectic and fun. Yeah. But you I've know, got a bracelet on, which is not helpful. The, on a sec. the trick, I think, is you know to be able to take just a couple of colours and to create something that just looks absolutely gorgeous, and it is. It is lovely. So I've, I'm actually at the point now of doing. I'll, I need to do the rib at the top. So I've finished the mitt itself really. Yeah, I think I'm at the right point to do the rib. Yeah, that looks right to me. But the the speckles, the one of the colours that I use actually is one of the colours that I'm using in today's yarn that I'm dyeing up and it's Jacquard Brown. Now Jacquard Brown is a great dye because it breaks when you use it as, as speckles. It breaks into the sort of individual colours that are within there and what you actually get is you get some speckles of blue, there's quite a lot of blue in there and then you also get speckles of like a sort of orangey colour plus you'll get the brown as well. So it's just fantastic and then I did use one other colour in this as well. I'd never knit this up, I literally dyed those two skeins, didn't really know how it was going to knit up. And I just think it's gorgeous and I can't wait to have the pair. But the little stitch pattern that's on the front, I actually used in a pair of socks and it was the Twinkle and Dance sock design. Now there is other things going on on that sock, but this particular stitch pattern is within sort of the body of the sock. So I, I use that, but I've concentrated it so there's more of the stitch pattern in this. So I'm using two and a half millimeter needles. I, always, I think I always use two and a half millimeter needles for, for mitts. I just find that that gives me a really nice gauge. I get about eight and a half stitches to the inch using two and a half millimeters. And that just, it's just for me, it's the perfect amount of sort of stretch, yet it's cozy enough for a mitt or a mitten. The basic sort of template of a pattern that I used for this is the, the same as, there's a couple of other mitt, fingerless mitt patterns out there that I've 
published. There is the foxglove cottage mitts and then there's also the dynamite mitts. So that's the sort of basic pattern I've used and then I've just put in this stitch pattern. But I'm just loving them and I knit really all of this pretty much all in one day because I was just loving seeing those speckles so much and the yarn's really nice you know with the sparkle in it's quite a subtle sparkle actually in this one I do find that sparkle does vary in different bases like I've used this one is a two ply which I think is the most common sparkle base but I actually prefer using these days I prefer using the uh, one that's a four ply base so it's like an 85 Oh, I don't know. Or is it 80, 50, and 5, something like that? Look, I'm not very everyone good. Everyone saw yeah, I, in the outtakes I, of the start of today's show. Good. I'm not very good with how good you are at breaking down yarns. <laughs> not very good with adding up to 100%, obviously. But I prefer now the sparkle base that's a four ply rather than a two ply. I just prefer the look of my stitches with a four plied yarn rather than a two ply yarn because you get that kind of rope sort of look don't you to your stitches when it's a two ply like this one and I think it it's sort of a bit more a bit more cushy as well when it's a four plied yarn but this I mean it, it, this is perfectly lovely and I'm absolutely loving knitting with it so all I've got to do on this first one is finish the rib go back and finish the little thumb and then I'll cast on the second and I think typically I only use maybe about 40 grams I think for a pair of fingerless mitts so I'll still have 60 grams of this left, which is probably enough to do a pair of socks if I do contrast cuff, heel and toe to look gorgeous with a brown as a contrast. It'd be very like light and autumnal, wouldn't it? So just lovely. And they are the perfect, actually, these are mitts. Fingerless mitts are the absolute perfect Christmas knit. You know, if you want a gift knit, because they're so quick, really quick. Like I said, this... They only use about 40 grams of yarn, so if you've got a half skein lying around, you can make a pair of mitts as a gift. And they really do fly off the needles. I could, if I was just knitting these, I could probably knit a pair in maybe three days, something like that. So if you, you, you know, if you wanted to do some for Christmas in July, you could have like, I don't know, four or five pairs. Couldn't you finished? and have them stacked up and waiting to wrap up for Christmas. So yeah, those are my lovely mitts. I haven't given them a name or anything, but just lovely. Absolutely loving, loving knitting them. Dan Jones, mm. ooh, exciting. What's on your needles? It's this, it's the stacker. Oh. And it's whatever you want to call that in whatever country you're in. <laughs> it's a tank top, everybody. Yeah. That's what I would call it anyway. I, I'm, I'm not even sure anymore. Isn't language funny? <laughs> so I'm funny. knitting one of these. Oh, no. And this is for Kate. I had the cast on with the sort of rubbishy, was it Rico? Oh, gosh, we had a bit of a Was yarn. it Rico? Yeah. We, it we was, went into detail we on this. We did, so we fine. said before. So I got rid of that because the yarn was just unpleasant to knit with. Look, at the end of the day, if it's not pleasant to knit with, there's no point knitting it, in my humble opinion. No, because no, I agree. Because you're going to spend an awful lot of time knitting whatever you're knitting. And, you know... Absolutely, talk about budget, but the yarn I'm using is cheap. <laughs> so, it is. you know, it's not about the money. You can always, I think, find within your budget a yarn which you're going to enjoy working with. So, I got rid of the the Rico, it was Eternity, wasn't it, or whatever it was called, that, that pattern. The pattern, by yes. By the same designer. And then Kay found this one, and I cast it on, and I showed it last time. I hadn't started the main colour work, but now I have. Oh. And the sizing's definitely right, which is lovely. Yeah. It's, I've, it been, I've been great. pulling it out. I mean, I you can the, have a look. I love the colour. This is really great fun because it's, you know, picking up on exactly the type of projects which I really enjoy knitting. It's Let Lopey, and I've used three different colours already. It's really nice. And they're, they're here. And, I mean, that's so cool because they're sort mm. of in size order too which is really uh, fun yeah it's mainly going to be this lovely magenta-y purpley sort yeah. of colour yeah but I love the way the three colours look together what's fun for me is oh I really love it when I've done these projects you normally cast on 
at the bottom, do lots and lots and lots of plain knitting and then do all the colour work at the top. And with this one you cast on, do all the colour work and then there's the interest of you know having to go mm -hmm. flat because it, it's obviously v-necked. Yeah. So I'll be knitting front and back and I've done things like this before on things like the Samantha. The interest which I would have had through the colour work knitting at the top has been replaced by what is always, you know, it's nice to be sat in your comfort zone, isn't it? And to be doing something, and yeah, I know what I'm doing now, to an extent. <laughs> there are always still moments, mm. aren't there, for all of us. But with this, hopefully it will be, I'll remember as soon as I start. I'm sure I will. But, you know, it's going to be great because as well, it'll be off the needles quite quickly. Mm. You're going to say something, sorry. No, I just love that dark colour. It's not Ooh. actually black. Oh, it isn't. Not even close. No, I can't remember the name of it. Can you see? It's not really black. It's cool. It's really it's the nice. Great thing that all the little Lope yarns is mm. the colours are unbelievably deep. Mm. There's, there's a lot mm. going on. Mm. Complex is probably the word, actually. And I love how you get all the little white fibres. Can you see all the little bits of white fibre from the white? So you can see them scattered over the other. It looks fantastic. I think the, 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 the really fun thing about because there's so much real estate on a garment you know there's so many different areas that you can be knitting mm. you know different things on it just creates such a big sort of wide blank canvas to really mm. play around with and what's been interesting for mm. me is recently for the first time I've been quite inspired I've started saying to Kay oh my goodness that would look great on the body of a jumper that would look great mm. on the arms of a jumper. Mm. Oh my goodness, that would look lovely on the on the yoke of a jumper. So whilst I'm never I'm never going to be a designer, but what's exciting is I'm sort of at a point where I'm starting to think more create. <laughs> I don't know how I was going to say that then. More creatively. Yeah, yeah. but it wasn't going to come out like that. All oh, right. In my head, it was going to come out weird. That's why I stopped. <laughs> I'm starting to think much more creatively w with projects and that I find that exciting because you know now I'm talking to you about potentially taking the numbers from uh, you know a jumper that I know works and plugging in mm -hmm. my own color work motifs and that is extremely exciting mm -hmm. and I think I'll probably talk in depth about that in the next self-contained knitter because did we even get to the point of talking about yarn and stuff a little bit? I think we did. When? Look, don't worry, you can't remember what happened yesterday, so we'll, we'll touch on the conversation that we had. He's actually right. Offline. I don't want to give away some of the designs that Kay's working on, because the great thing is um, for me is with me... Lots. ...being able to sort of watch designs take shape, I then get to see things which no one else does, and that then sparks me off thinking, oh my goodness, that would look so great in this, that or the other, which is wonderful. It's such a creative environment. We actually just did a radio show all about motivation. Mm. And I think a big part of motivation is being in the right sort of environment for whatever it is that you're looking to be motivated to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for, for me, in this environment, where there's, you know, amazing projects appearing and, you know, ideas sort of flying around, it makes it an unbelievably creative environment to sort of craft in, mm -hmm. uh, which is just wonderful. Yes, this is a really great change of pace for me. You know, doing something with a colour work at the bottom, no sleeves, straight up, front and back i mean just marvelous yeah and you know it'll be interesting to see how fast i actually get this finished because it mm. should be substantially quicker it, than it, yeah, a it, sleeve it, jumper very quick because yeah. it's it's not long i don't want it super long no no yeah what else is on your needles so the second thing i'm working on oh, is this a... new no no this, this one's old? not new i'm saving the other new that's thing. okay for my last thing. We get new at the start and at the finish. Yes, I That's need, okay. I need a sock blocker. Because I'm working on Bryony's Star Trek themed socks and I've finished a sock and I'm on the second one. Oh, and it's great. I love it. I'm trying to get these done for her because she's, she just loves them and she's like, oh, oh, I can't wait to wear those and oh, I'm going to watch an episode with Wesley in when I wear those. <laughs> she's such a geek. It's it's hilarious. But yeah, I finished one of them. Oh, I think it looks great. Look, 
Oh, isn't it fun? Perfect colours. Yeah, I really love it. And the pattern's lovely in the, sh in the It uh, is, in the yeah. Shoe. So I showed these last time, but these socks are inspired by the lovely Wesley Crusher from Star Trek The Next Generation. And in one of the episodes, probably in more, more than one actually, it was quite a regular appearing jumper, I think, that he wore. It looked like this. It had a dark grey sort of little bit of a polo neck and then he had stripes, the sort of Star trek -y coloured stripes and then the body of the jumper was this sort of blue colour. So I've replicated that in a sock for Bryony and I finished the first one. So these top colours here I dyed and she's already got a pair of socks that I knit not not that long ago for her in these colours and these are the, the leftovers and literally the red I've just I'm on the second sock now but that's all I've got left of the red after I've worked it into the second sock so I'm literally using every tiny scrap and I'm not going to get rid of this I'm going to keep it because you never know when you might need a little bit of Star Trek yarn and then this blue is a Cascade Heritage Silk so that is an 85 superwash merino and 15% silk and it's number 5765 Cascade Heritage Silk and it's really lovely on and I put in just to make it interesting for me I just put in the Hermione's everyday stitch pattern into the body of the sock and then I've just used my standard sort of slip stitch heel, a square turn and my umbrella toe and I think it looks just great and I've got the second one on the go so I'm up to the yellow now, the yellow stripe here so I definitely will have these done for next time so that she can have them and I'm using a Addy needle I believe for these, doing magic loop yeah and I'm using Addy two and a half mil again because Bryony really likes her socks not to be too sucky in she does like them more a more slightly relaxed fit so I've found that using two and a half mils is perfect for her and again I get I generally get about eight and a half stitches to the inch which I think is a good gauge anyway for socks I think generally it, vary, it can vary greatly, but I would say that sock gauges vary between eight stitches to the inch and it can go as up as high as 10, I think, if you're a really tight knitter. But I would say that most people probably fall somewhere in the middle of that. And I find that eight and a half stitches is a really good gauge. It gives the sort of, it's not too, I don't, not too constricted. I don't like, I'm the same. I don't like socks that are really like sucking you on your feet. What are you giggling away at? Oh, nothing. It, it just for the first time ever in all the years of knitting, it made me laugh when you said tight knitter because in my head, and this all happened in the blink of an eye, I imagined a knitting group that met at a coffee shop and uh, they all meet up every week. And when they meet up, it's always everyone, you know, someone else buys the drinks. But there's one knitter who <laughs> never buys the drinks. And everyone always says, oh, she's such a tight knitter, that Gladys. <laughs> Gladys, I mean, will everybody know that that if, if somebody you might not. No, you might not. But if you don't like spending money, you're then tight. You're, you're tight. So it, you it know, just made me laugh because I'd never thought of it. Always, to me, a tight knitter had been what we all understand a tight knitter to yeah, be. Yeah. But then suddenly, in that moment, <laughs> I thought funny. of Gladys, the poor tight Glad knitter, poor Gladys, who, who never buys anyone a coffee, never buys a coffee at, at the knitting group at Costas. And you're always like, oh, that's she's Gladys. such a tight knitter. What a tight knitter! <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. So again. Use that in today. You, you've got to somehow today reference someone who's that you know that's tight. <laughs> yeah, we, can I, well, think, no. we can all think of someone, what, can't what would we? Be that doesn't that like would spending be, money. What would be interesting would be is do you un, do you know what that means? Do you under, yeah? Do you understand Have that? Have you that heard of that before? Yeah, maybe it's just an English saying. It could even be just a Yorkshire saying. Well, it might just be a Yorkshire saying. So please do yeah. comment below if you know. That if you call someone tight, that means yeah. that they don't particularly enjoy spending money. They'll spend someone else's, they just don't like yeah, spending yeah, don't their like own spending money. Their own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some would say thrifty, others would say tight. Yes. I think there's a difference. 
difference between there's a someone, huge difference. there's a huge difference between someone who's thrifty and careful with money and someone who's just tight. Yes, because yeah. I think a tight person lacks generosity. Yes, yes, and a thrifty person can be the most generous person in yeah. the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. it's not thrifty. It is ungenerous. Yes, that that is the thing. Yes, yeah. yeah. So that's my Wesley socks. Well on the way to being a fin finished pair. Very much enjoying them. I really like this Cascade Heritage Silk. I mean, if it wears nicely, then I will definitely use it again. So it, it's perfectly lovely to knit with. Really, you know, just smooth, really nice. It's got a slight sheen to it from the silk, but not anything overly shiny. You know, you could use it. It's not, you know, it's not particularly feminine, I suppose, is what I'm wanting to say. It's very universal. Really lovely. Oh, you're holding up an enormous jumper. Are you finished? Yes, I'm finished. Excellent, look at this. It's the Alexander. And, oh my goodness, the third colour is going in. Can you see the green? You can see it at the top there. And do you know what? When I put the first row in, initially it was like, oh, I'm not sure about this. But then as each row then goes in on top, it starts to just make everything else sing. Yeah, I think it's great. And I think, again, this really does pick up on the the sort of subtlety vibe. Because, yes, to be completely subtle, you could argue that that would actually be plain, would have been not to add this additional colour. Yeah. By adding this additional colour, it just, it's a tiny pop in mm -hmm. the grand scheme of things. Yeah, yeah. But it picks up on the green in the body and it makes everything else really sort of pop and stand out. I'm so excited by it. And what I'm even more excited about it is that I picked it. And that's the first time ever that that's really yeah, happened. Yeah, you picked the colour, you did. I mean, yes, I was working within boundaries laid out by Kay. <laughs> but still, what's up? I think I wrote the colourway name on the ball band. All oh, right, okay. I did. So it is really now taking shape. I think I've just done my second or maybe even third round of decreases. So the hole is getting smaller. And I cannot wait to get this one finished. Yeah. Because I have a feeling this one might be my favourite. I don't know. Is this the one with the funny collar? Yeah, but it won't be because we're just going to copy. We're not going to do that, are we? We're no. just going to copy the other one that we did. I'm just going to do a collar that I know works. You're just so going to do a normal... I'm going... Because the, the numbers are the same on all the three jumpers that yeah. I've knitted. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to pop the other ones on. So that's the Rodari and the Anniversary. Mm. And then I'll just, because each of those collars is slightly different. Mm. And I'll just decide which one right. I like the most. Right. Now, well, I don't know. I'm not gonna make any comment at the moment. Yeah, but the green in there, if you, have, it's this one here. Gorgeous color, isn't it? It's Spring Green Heather. Beautiful. From Lopi. And it's in, look what it's in. It's in Dan's new gigantic... Oh, yes. ...jumper bag. I know. How exciting is this? I mean, just perfect. And look at the top stitching. Yeah. It's marvellous. There's lots of top stitching, actually. I top stitched... I made it, by the way. <laughs> Beautifully lined with Vaseline. <laughs> it has. It's got the violin. A bit or squishy. Whatever it's called. <laughs> Yeah, because they stand up. I don't know if you can see it like that. Like they stand when they've got that, that sort of lining in. And they're nice and sturdy, but still really squishy. What do you use Vaseline for? It's, it's, it's like... Is it an antiseptic? No. It's, it's not an antiseptic. What you do put you it use on it your for lips, it? don't you? It's like a... Vaseline, you put it on your lips, you put it on dry, cracked skin. I need to talk to my mum, because I seem to recall as a child... It's not an antiseptic. I seem to recall as a child, I don't know why, but I always seem to have Vaseline on. Well, <laughs> it might be because it will produce... It's petroleum jelly, basically. Yeah. It's, it's derived from petrol. But it forms a seal, doesn't it? So if you put it over the top of something... It'll stop bad stuff getting in. I would have thought so, but right. it does wipe off. Right. So you'd have to be careful with it. Yeah. I sort um, of remember... I remember the feel of Vaseline going on as a kid. And also, as well, I spent the whole of my childhood smelling of germaline. Germaline, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that yeah. was through falls off my bike. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, we've all had that, haven't we? Um, but yeah, I made him this huge bag with Back to the Future fabric on top. 
and then inside it's got a fabric which has got teeny tiny little knit stitches. I don't know if you can see it, but it's lovely. And so it's that's his, his new it's massive. Perfect. I still don't think it's quite big enough. It could have been a little bit bigger, but you can get that whole jumper in it, can, can't you? So. Yes. Because the old bag that I was using looks a bit like the bag that Gladys uses for the knitting <laughs> group at Costas. Oh, she is tight, that Gladys. <laughs> She's had that bag for years. She has, she has. <laughs> Won't buy another one. It's really funny that you're talking germaline, and because I do just remember, I remember me and my friend Simon Brown making these cool swords, mm. these wooden swords. It was just a wooden stick, and then we hammered nails in to make the hilt, yeah. and then we wrapped string around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his looked perfect. His, you know, looked like a proper hilt to protect yeah. the hand. Mine looked like a potato. <laughs> It just sort of grew. And then I covered it in black masking tape. Right. I mean, it was just useless. The reason why that I remember it is this, of course, I might have mentioned this before, it's famously the stick that I stuck in the front of my bike and then cycled oh, forward, gosh. came over the top, and that's how I got. Why would you think that that wouldn't cause an accident? I think I knew it would, and oh, I thought you... it would be fun to do it. God, boys, what a boys like. I came flying off the top. I know exactly where you I could have. To. Did you? I bet you didn't have a helmet on, did you? Back, course, in, course back in those days. I didn't wear a bike helmet for ever. Well, no kids. <laughs> the whole time I cycled. <laughs> no kids back in the day wore bike helmets. I used to go mountain biking. I never wore bike no, helmets. No, no pads, no bike helmets, no. no nothing. Just don't fall off. Don't fall off. Or you'll hurt yourself. But yeah, I came. I stuck it in the front, pedalled as hard as I could, and literally flew over the handlebars. And I, I still have the scar. Got the scar on his knee. Yeah, and yeah. that is the scar. You know, the smell of germaline immediately makes me think of that scar, yeah, which yeah, makes yeah, me yeah. think of that bike and that fall. I've got a scar on my knee actually. I don't know if right. it's the same knee, just like that. Right. And I did it. I was running down the hill when I was little after my my brother had gone to the sweet shop without me, <sighs> and I was running down the hill with it that we lived on, and I fell and slid. Oh, and no. cut my knee and I remember just sat in the kitchen like sobbing and my mum cleaning it up and putting probably germaline on it. What else is on your needles? Right, so the last thing on my needles is everyone. Okay, so I know it's the 1st of July today, so technically the start of our knit along is today. That's fine. You got that on this morning. I saw you. Okay. Let's believe that I didn't cheat. Let's pretend. Okay. Wasn't that a TV show? Let's pretend, yeah, I think it was. Let's pretend. I could hear a song, but that's not it. That's not the song, you just made that up. What happens in it? I can't remember. But I think People was pretend. Some... I'm guessing. Probably. What's yeah. in your bag? So, yes, this is my Christmas in July project that I cast on, yes, just this morning. She did. I saw her do it. <laughs> so, it's my Christingle Mingle Cowl which I released last time, the pattern has been released and I really desperately wanted to knit another one, so I am! And it's in my lovely Christmas bag from Emma at Moo and Mouse. She did put some of these in her shop actually, I noticed recently and I'm sure they will have all sold because they're just fantastic. But yeah, it's in my lovely patchwork bag. And here it is. So I've done the ribbing and I've done about, hmm, inch or two, two inches maybe, from the ribbing. So here we go. Oh, I love it. Now it's subtle, but this, this first section here is striped. The colours are subtle, but that's absolutely fine. That's how I wanted this one. So it's got this gorgeous rib, which is just lovely to knit. These sort of bands of little bits of lace. And then you go into some stripes and then you go into a bit of just solid stocking stitch. I just love the colours. And I've got the other one here, so you can see this is the original one. So I am to the point of here, just here, after this first speckle. But I really wanted this one to be, I showed you the, the yarns last time, but my idea was to have, with this design, ideally you want, it uses 12 mini skeins and you want six of them to be sort of solids, semi-solids or tonals and then you want six of them to be lovely speckled yarns. So the six solids this time I'm using Cascade Heritage in a sort of array of peaches running through to like a deep, that sort of colour. So it starts off with this gorgeous peach. This is Chanterelle. It's one of my absolute favourite colours from Cascade Heritage. And it's going to run all the way down to this deep colour. And it goes through all of these sort of gorgeous peachy, orangey shades. 
and then I've got some lovely speckles that will be interspersing those lovely colours. And this first speckle that I'm using, it's actually a yarn that I've used before. The colourway is called Glimmer and it's by Life in the Long Grass. And I used this yarn in a pattern called the Glimmer Mitts and I had quite a bit left over. And they were just little fingerless mitts that had beading on them and it just had a thumb slot so they were like really simple but it had lovely beading and it had a lovely pico edge top and bottom really pretty mitts but yeah i had quite a bit left over so that's the first color that i decided to use it's re a really subtle speckle actually you can see more speckle oh no my stitches just came off and it's got one of those Aha! oh no see Oh, so that was a disaster, wasn't it? And I've even got one of those stoppery things and it came off, so... Oh, that's rubbish. Anyway, <laughs> that's my lovely cowl, the start of my Christingle Mingle. And I'm just going to be working my way through that this month. If I don't finish it this month, that's fine. When I knit the first one, I did actually knit it, yeah, the whole thing, through December. Because there's, there's 12 different sort of sections to the pattern. But the idea was that you've got a couple of days to knit, knit each of those sections. So yeah, I'm really loving it. I love the colours, really pretty. Now many of you may have noticed Kate's wonderful bracelet. You know us here at Baker Bears HQ. Oh yes, we tell you when things are good. Here's my lovely bracelet. And we tell you when things are not good. Now this is a lovely bracelet, but this bracelet wasn't for Kay. No. This well, bracelet was a Father's Day present for me. So, yeah, I really like Dan in, in bracelets. He's got a leather one that he wears quite often. And I just, I really like that look of sort of like a leather bracelet and then maybe some beads. He looks really nice wearing bracelets. So I thought, oh, I'm going to get him. Especially now I'm doing the weights as well. Yeah, Dan started weights. He's got some muscles on his arms. It's very nice. <laughs> Carry on. Um, yes, but oh, I'm distracted now by arms. But <laughs> yeah, I and bracelets. I went looking for. I wanted one of these bracelets that's multi, so you get it on a string like this, and then you twist it into sort of three sections and pop it over. And it's lovely. It's on like an elastic sort of band. And I found a company in London. And they did loads of different, would they be classed as semi-precious stones? I don't know. This one is, I think it's a red tiger eye stone. And it's, tiger's eye is normally a bit more orange than that. This one's a bit more red. And I really thought that's really nice. And it was sort of medium priced, it, you know, it was a, very much plenty to pay. But it looked really lovely and I measured Dan's wrist sort of surreptitiously, ordered the size that I thought that it said would fit him. It came beautifully packaged and obviously didn't try it on him until Father's Day. And then when he put it on, it was way too small. I was absolutely fuming. Like, you know, it was stretched so that you could see you know, you can see the elastic when it was on his wrist and he did leave it on for a while and it left three bead marks on his wrist. It was just too small. So we just assumed that, you know, it's one of those things. Yeah. But what Kay had done, which was really sweet, is she thought it would be cool if we had matching bracelets. Yeah. And so Kay's one arrived. I ordered one in the meantime. And you ordered, obviously, a much smaller and one. I ordered a size medium. I'd ordered a large for Dan, and I ordered a size medium for me, measured my wrist, looked on their chart. So when Kay's arrived, I don't know how or... Was it you? I don't know how it happened, but... I you, you, you I just measured, thought, oh, I, put, right. I, I measured one again. Yeah, let's I, put them next to each other. I measured one against the other, and I even counted the beads on them, and they were the same. So I said, now, right. Now, interestingly, on the boxes, it doesn't say anything about size. No. So you know, if you were packing a box, you wouldn't know. How would you know? You you wouldn't know. <laughs> There's no reference on it to whether it is small, medium, or large. You're relying on someone putting it on the right bit of the shelf, aren't you? Yeah. 
and you know you know how easy it is for things to go back in the yeah. totally you know mistakes happen yeah so you contacted them so I thought I'm not having this so I contacted them and I explained the situation I said look to me it looks like I've got two size mediums they're exactly the same I sent them a photo of the two bracelets side by side laid out so you could see they were exactly the same size I explained it was a gift, you know, I'm really disappointed, you know, can you tell me how I can resolve this? I got a very brusque email back. With no apology? No apology. I still haven't had an apology. I've had three email conversations with them. No apology yet. And this is a London store in a really posh bit of London, right? And so they basically said to me, here is a return label, send it us back. It was that simple. So I replied back to them. I said, OK, I'll send it you back tomorrow. I said, but you've not mentioned the postage. And they just replied back to me and it just said, we will pay your postage. That was it. Right? OK. So you sent it back. I sent it back. And you sent it back a little while I ago. I sent it back special delivery. So you emailed them to say so what's I, going on. I emailed them yesterday because they would have had it a week yesterday, not heard anything from them. I emailed them and said, look, can you tell me what's going on with this exchange? I really want the size large. This was a gift, blah, blah, blah. I'd be really grateful if I could get this as soon as possible. I got a two-line reply back and it just said, we will try and ship it to you ASAP. That was it. Brilliant. We will try and ship it to you ASAP. The, the era, let me tell you, the era of customer service. It's gone. In fact, when did it arrive? I've, I think maybe it arrived in the 40s. I've never, and it wasn't cheap, you know, this was a really special gift and I was so We've excited, learned, we yeah, were like, oh, we can have matching bracelets and it'll be really nice. It was so disappointed and on Father's Day, Kay was I like, was like absolutely devastated, I was like, I cannot believe it, because Dan doesn't often wear his wedding ring because he has just issues with wearing a ring, so I just thought, oh, we can both wear bracelets and that'll be really nice and they'll be matching and everything, and it just like ruined the whole thing i was so disappointed it's just it's highly disappointing but hopefully hopefully every we player has a silver know. lining we're good we'll let you know i have a theory ladies and gentlemen that it's going to return and it'll be the same and it'll either be exactly the same bracelet mm. or it will be exactly the same size yeah because there is a chance that they sent us two large ones. There is. Because no one bothered to tell Kay no. if they were too large or too mediums. But I don't see what how does this quality. Can be, I don't no, know yeah. how that can be a size large on a lady's wrist. Well, you wouldn't, and it's a man's bracelet. It's not a lady's so. bracelet, it's no. a man's bracelet. It's for dudes. It's for dudes. <laughs> Speaking of gifts, makes me think of Christmas. And we are, of course, sallying forth into our Christmas in July count. Yes. This is going to be an absolutely superb Christmas party. And what do we need to get this Christmas party started? Well, I shall tell you what. We need the perfect festive colourway. Perfect. 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 I've gone all parlarking. You, you have. Yes, yeah. it's Darling Buds of May time. <laughs> we need the perfect... I never watched that. Well, as I think people may remember, it was filmed at my house. It was uh, filmed. Anyway. It was filmed at your house, yeah. We need the perfect Christmas colourway. And thanks to a certain master dyer over here, I think uh. we've just about got you covered. Over the last seven years, I have created hundreds of gorgeous colourways. Hidden away in my library is the little book that contains nearly all my secrets. These are the recipes for creating all of my colourways, and in this series, I'll be showing you some of my absolute favourites. I'll be taking you from undyed skein to finished colourway because it's time for us to discover. Welcome everyone to another My Favourite Colourways. I'm very excited to be here with you today. What I'm not excited about is the fact that it's really warm. <laughs> it's, oh, it's been super, super warm. We're well into summer now. Summer has officially landed here in the UK, I would say, and it's been super warm. Now, the one advantage of that when you're dyeing yarn is that you should be able to dry it outside quite quickly. However, <laughs> we've got a storm predicted for today. We're not quite sure when it's going to arrive. Some, sometime between midday and 10 o'clock at night. 
Who knows? So my point in telling you this is that we might be able to dry the um, yarn on the line today, but we, I might not be able to, but you know, whatever, we will get it dry as we always do. So what I've chosen to show you today is relevant for a couple of reasons. And the main reason actually is because we're just into July now and we are gonna be running a lovely Christmas in July knit along. So I was inspired by that and I thought, why not try and mentally cool ourselves down from the heat by dyeing up a Christmas colorway. So I've gone through my dye book. Actually, I'm, I kind of knew the color that I wanted to dye up. I've not dyed up really that many Christmas colorways, I don't think. But this one jumped out at me. I only dyed it maybe mm, two, three times at the most, I would say. Because I always look back on my Etsy shop just to remind myself what it actually looked like in the skein, because it's quite some years since I've dyed this. And I just wanted to sort of, I, I, I remembered it, but I just wanted to refresh my mind. So I could see in the Etsy shop that it was, there were diff that there's two or three different batches, so I knew I'd dyed it two or three different times. So somebody out there might still have a skein of this lurking in their stash, you never know. So what we're gonna be dyeing up today is inspired by Beatrix Potter. Now I've got here, I've got my dye book, thankfully my rescue dye book, because it's in that one. But I brought Bryony's Beatrix Potter book, and in all honesty, she's, she's not really read it. <laughs> She's not never really been a mad Beatrix Potter fan. Um, she was more Charlie and Lola books and things like that. But it's lovely to have, and I've actually referenced this book several times. I don't think you need to be a child at all to re read Beatrix Potter. I think a lot of adults collect her books. And right at the very back, there is a, I say it's a story, but it didn't actually start out as a story. It's this one here, The Rabbit's Christmas Party, and that's the name of the colourway today. So it's The Rabbit's Christmas Party is what we're going to be dying up. Now, this wasn't a story, there's like a little bit of information here. It was actually a series of six paintings that she did in the early 1890s, and she gifted the originals to a couple of different people. Now, in the film, if you've seen Miss Potter, the film with Rennie Zellweger, it's a brilliant film, I've watched it several times, I absolutely love it. In the film, this particular painting that inspired this colourway, she actually gave to, oh, I can't remember his first name, it was the Warren brother that she sort of fell in love with. It wasn't Frederick, was it? I can't remember his first name, but if you've seen the film, you'll know which of the brothers. He, he, he died, sadly, before they could actually get married, but I think they were secretly engaged. In the film, they certainly were. I, were, I don't know if that's true in real life. Um, but the particular painting, they're beautiful, beautiful paintings. It's the second to last one. It's this one here, and it says, Roasting Apples Around the Hearth. And so you've got the rabbits here, all in front of the blazing fire, and they're roasting some apples, so there's apples here. And then we've got some sort of Christmas um, greenery on the mantelpiece, and then some holly with holly berries here. So this was the beautiful painting that inspired this colourway. And the colours that I took out of it, we've got the rabbit colour, we've got the greens, from the greenery that's there. And then we've also got the sort of reddish tones from the apples and from the berries. I also, when I sold this yarn, I also dyed up an accompanying mini skein. And the mini that I dyed up was inspired by this painting, which is when the party guests arrive for the Christmas party. And it was the color of these lovely gentleman rabbit they look like gentlemen rabbits. They're raincoats. It's this kind of metally grey. So that was the coordinating mini that I put with it. Now I am gonna do a coordinating colour today, but it's not that one. I thought it would be a bit more adventurous and I'm going to use some of the colours that are actually within the skein of yarn that we're gonna create. And I'm winging it. You know, I've, I've never, 
I just thought, right, I'll use those two colours and we'll see what happens with the coordinating skein. So that'll be fun, who knows what that's going to look like, but um, I'm sure it'll be lovely, but that'll be fun, fun to do as well. So, Rabbit's Christmas Party, it is today. I hope you enjoy it. And the first thing we've got to do, of course, is find out what we are going to need. All the usual suspects. So, first of all, yarn. Now, what I've got today Ignore those two. I've just got a few minis there. I'm going to do a bit of personal dyeing as well. What I've got is three skeins of fingering weight yarn. I'm going to be doing two skeins of the main colour and then one skein of the coordinating colour that we're going to do. So this is just the fingering weight base that I prefer to use these days. I love this one. It's an 85-15, so 85% superwash merino, 20% that doesn't add up to 100. Why do I always have problems adding up to 100? Every single time. I said 85.15 and then I said 20. 85% superwash merino, 15% nylon equals 100. I did it. So I've got three skeins of that. I actually buy my yarn. I will tell you, I get asked this question a lot. I have mentioned it before, but I currently get my yarn from a UK based company called Yarn Undyed. They do ship internationally. They're an excellent company. I've never had a problem with them. I've, I've purchased several times and you can buy in much small, smaller quantities. I did used to use a different supplier when I dyed to sell yarn, but you have to buy in, in bulk. With this particular supplier, you can buy single skeins of quite a lot of the, the yarn bases. I tend to buy the packs of five skeins and they're really good. I've never had an issue with them at all. So it's yarn and dyed. So I've got my three skeins of yarn there and I've got my <laughs> dye book. I'm not gonna lose that again. Got some old tea towels. I've got my citric acid, which is the mordant. I prefer to use citric acid. That's what sets the color in our dye. I've got my mask, of course, rubber gloves, my trusty big spoon, we're definitely gonna need that today. My measuring spoon for this one. This colorway is, is not truly speckled because we're not going to sort of brush speckle the dye on, but it is a more sort of delicate looking dye. In all honesty, and this is interesting, I never actually knit up this colourway. With most of the colourways that I dyed, that I sold, I did at some stage knit them up so I would know what they looked like. This one I didn't, I've never knit this up, so I'm gonna be doing that into my uh, wrist, wrist tickler, so that'll be really interesting. So this is like a voyage of discovery. <laughs> we will see together, won't we? But yeah, I'm gonna be needing my teaspoon. This is an eighth of a teaspoon measure, so I'm gonna need that. I've got my plastic washing up bowl for soaking and rinsing and then my pots which are as always it's these sort of large casserole pots stainless steel I like the ones with two handles because they're easy to move around and then finally the dye colours now I'm going to be using five colours all together today I've got two that are jacquard and I've got three that are landscape dyes as I've done before what I'll do is I'll tell you the colours and then I will tell you the type of colour it is so that if you can't get these brands then you can just try and find something that is sort of a comparable shade so the two jacquard colours are brown fairly straightforward, 635 brown and cherry red. So the brown is, I suppose I'd describe this type of a brown as like bark brown. Do you know that sort of brown of a tree? There is a lot of blue in this brown if that's helpful because when you speckle this yarn, it breaks and you do see lots of blue specks. So it's a brown that does have a lot of blue in it. You know, rather than some browns can be sort of red browns, can't they? This is definitely a blue brown. So that's brown from Jacquard and then cherry red, which is number 617. And as this describes, it's a cherry color. 
it's, it's definitely red, but you know, it leans more towards that sort of cherry. Now this particular dye, the cherry red, I've, I mean, we'll see what this one's like, but I remember having issues with the cherry red. It kind of sort of clumps together a little bit. I found that it was a bit more difficult to handle within the, when you're dyeing. So we'll see how this fares today, but it's a really lovely color. And then the three landscape dyes, I've got alfalfa, which is a sort of slightly bright mossy green. We've got fern, which is another green, and that is more of a, well, like a fern color. It's, it's a, I think it's got blue tones in it. And then the last landscape dye is plum. And I don't think I've ever used this colour with you before. And it's a, literally a plum colour, so it's that kind of reddish purplish, you know, the skin of a plum, the purple sort of plums. So we've got plum, we've got fern, we've got alfalfa, and then brown and cherry red from Jacquard. So there we go, that's everything we're going to need. So first thing we've got to do is to get these lovely arms into soak. Okay, so in my bowl here, I've just got some warm water from the tap and I've added in a good scoop of the citric acid, which is probably a tablespoon or so, something like that. Giving it a stir around and then I'm just gonna plonk in the yarn and I've also got just a couple of minis that I'm just, I'm just doing this for myself. So I'm just gonna pop those in, push them down until they're all really well soaked. And I'm just gonna leave those to soak for about half an hour or so. We just want that yarn to really absorb the citric acid so it gets all the way through the fibers. So leave that to soak for a little bit while we get everything ready over on the stove. So I've got in my pot, I've got it filled with water to about a third full and I've put in some more citric acid, another good scoop, you know, a tablespoon or so of citric acid in there and that is heating up nicely now. So I'm going to put my two skeins into the pot. So let's find the two skeins, there we go. So this is at a nice soak and I'm just going to squidge it just so I don't introduce too much extra water into the pot. Okay, so I'm gonna now pop those in. As they go in, I'm going to, like I normally do, I'm just gonna make sure that I try and get as much surface area of the skeins onto the top of the water. So I just, I, I do this because I just want to create a random effect. I don't want it to be a regular effect. If I was to dye these in sort of the flat pans, then you, I, I think you just get more of a regular pattern, just inevitably because, you know, it's in a, a flat format, but it's just how I'd prefer to do it. So I've made sure that I've got lots of surface area showing. So, you know, and I like to sort of dig down and pull bits up from underneath and go with that. So now I'm just going to bring my heat up and get that to the point where it's sort of too hot to put your hand in. Don't put your hand into boiling water, everybody. I wouldn't recommend that, but you know what I mean? I don't want it to be boiling like a rolling boil. I just want it to be nice and hot. So really, as soon as it starts to simmer, and I see some steam coming up, and it is already simmering actually, then what I do, because I know the kind of temperature that I like it to be, I just stick my little finger in. I, I'm not telling you to do that by any means, <laughs> but I, I just judge it better that way. 
it's not quite hot enough yet so I'm just going to give this probably just a minute. Okay so that's now up to temperature, that's really too hot for me to put my little finger in so I know that we're about there. So I've now got my mask on and we're going to put in the first colour. So we're starting off with the brown. I'm going to take about a half of an eighth of a teaspoon of the brown. There we go, so we've got about a half there. And I'm just going to sprinkle it all over the surface. Quite sort of, um, not too heavily. I just want to sort of delicately distribute it over. Because you will inevitably like there look a bigger, a bigger amount fell off. That's fine. That's what creates the interest in a skein, you know, you'll get some areas with more, some with less. So just go, keep going all the way over and get to the edges as well. And then I'm going to go in with my big spoon and just push that down a little bit like this. So this, you can see we're not going to get a true speckle in terms of tiny little specks. That's not what we're after. It is more of a variegated, but sort of gently variegated, I would say. And the reason I'm pushing it is because I want some areas to be more concentrated, but then I want to get some areas that have got a more gentle shade of brown. And you can see that's what's happening. And if you think there's not enough on there, go back and put a bit more, you know, if you want it a bit more concentrated but what I'm heading for is something quite delicate really and that looks about right so I'll just leave that for a couple of minutes just to set that colour the way I sort of judge whether it's set is if you sort of pop your spoon in and drop it back down and just look at the colour of the water that drops back down and I could see that was still quite brown. Leave it two or three minutes and then try it again. And when you do that and it drops back down and it's fairly clear, then you know that you can move on to the next colour. So this is why this colourway actually differs from ones I've done previously because what I would normally do is I would normally sort of turn the skein and then put on more brown. I'm not going to do that with this one. We've only got one layer of each of the colours. So that's what the difference is. So this will probably knit up, you know, differently to ones I've done previously and that's exciting, isn't it? So let's move the skein. So we're going to lift it up. We've just got a little hint of brown in there, nothing to worry about. So you can see at the moment, we've got lots of these lovely brown shades running all the way down here. But we look on the other side, there's a little bit, which is good, but not too much. So what we're gonna do now is just shuffle these around. So I'm just gonna move that and I'm also gonna turn it like that. Same with the other one, there we go. And then, so you can see now I've moved it, you can see we've got lots of areas that still have nothing and lots that have got those bits of rabbity brown on. So drop it back in the pot and as we move this around again, that little bit of brown that's left in there will just get sucked up. So you can see as we've moved it, what's happened is now we've got bits of brown showing, but we've also got areas that have got pretty much nothing. And that's perfect, that's what we want. So again, I'm just gonna give it a good old shuffle round to make sure that we've got a good bit of the yarn showing. There we go. Oh, it's quite hot. <laughs> so now we're gonna move on to the next layer of color. and This is the greens. So what we're gonna do here is we're actually going to layer one green on top of another green. And again, this is something we've not done before, so this is very exciting. So I'm gonna start with the fern, and I'm going to sprinkle on about, a, the same again, about a half, about a half of an eighth. And I'm gonna do the same thing, so I'm just gonna sprinkle that over. It's a lovely shade of green, this. And these actually are very festive colours, I think. We've got greens, we've got reds, and we will have some reds. I also think, to me, brown seems a festive colour somehow. You know, chocolate logs and all of that. I'm just going to quickly get my spoon, give that a little press down. Lovely. And now I'm going to go straight to my alfalfa 
and I'm going to get about an eighth of the alfalfa, probably a heaped eighth. I find that this colour is not a very strong colour. So I've got, you know, a heaped eighth and I'm going to go over the green area that I've already done. Doesn't matter if you get other areas as well, but primarily over the green that we did and then push that down. And what that, that colour does, because that's sort of a mossy green, it kind of knocks back that brightness of the fern. So we will still get some areas that are quite a vivid green, but we will get some areas that are a more gentle green. And I can see now, for over here for example, you might not be able to see it on screen, but we've got brighter green here, but here, I've got a more delicate, mossy, pale green, which is lovely. And it will also impact on the browns that you've already got there. And it will change the shade of those. It changes it more to a dark grey. So again, that's lovely. We're going to get another shade there. So that's the greens in. So again, just leave that for a couple of minutes. I find the landscape dyes set really quickly because they do actually have a mordant, as I understand it. They've also got a mordant within it. So that helps them set super quick. But I'll just give them a couple of minutes and then we can do that final layer of colour. Okay, so we can move it again now for that final layer of colour. Let's have a look. So again, we've just got the merest hint of green in there. That's fine. And you can see now we've got greens and browns in there. Oh, it's lovely. So let's move, give that a little shifty again. And drop it back down. And again, that last bit of green will just disappear when we have finished moving things around. And then we can do the gorgeous sort of berry colours. But you can see now we've got, we, you know, it is quite delicate. It's looking lovely. The way it looks in the pot there, I think is really nice. So let's add this last layer of colour. So I'm going to start with the plum. I'm going to do the same as I did for the greens. I'm going to layer one on top of the other. So let's go with half of an eighth again. Exactly the same. I'm going to sort of stick to the areas of, of white that I can see, but I'm going to get some on the, the rest as well. So sprinkle it over. Oh, it's a lovely colour. <laughs> it's really nice. And I think those sort of berry colours at Christmas as well. Holly berries and cranberry. So let's see what that's like when we give it a little push on whether we need to add a bit more. Isn't it lovely? Because that's so, oh, you see, I'm tempted to add a tiny bit more, but you know, sometimes less is more, isn't it? Okay, I'm just gonna go for a tiny bit more just around the edges there that I kind of missed. Rinse off my spoon as well in there. Just push that bit down. Okay. So now I'm going to go with the cherry red. Now let's see what happens with this cherry because I do remember it being temperamental. Now I'm going to go with about a quarter of an eighth, not as much of the cherry. But again, just on top of the plum primarily. But if you get other areas too, that's fine. It looks like it's gone on okay actually. This is a different pot to the one that I was using back then. So it might have just been that I'd got a dodgy pot. It's very different, that colour, to the plum. And what that's going to do is it's just going to change the shade of the plum to a more reddish tone. And where it hits the green, it's going to change that as well to just a much more muted sort of underlying colour. But you, sometimes you can't even quite identify what colour it is. Okay, so that's the last colour that's gone in. So what I'm going to do is raise the temperature. Very quickly it starts to simmer because we really had it at quite a hot temperature. And then as soon as that has come to the, a good simmer and you can see it moving around the yarn on top, I'm just going to turn that off and then pop it outside to cool off. Right, so that is our yarn all dyed up. It's cooling and 
What we will be doing next is having a look at the mini skein. So we'll take a little break, you can go and have a cup of tea and I will see you back in part two when we're going to be dyeing up that who knows what it's going to look like. I'm sure it'll be lovely but the coordinating colour for the rabbit's Christmas party. goodness that is so gorgeous those colors just for me just scream pudding pudding yeah do they now of course a huge oh. proportion of our well no you see now you see i think we've we've probably educated people because <laughs> lots of people would think we've converted them to our way of thinking lots of people would think in normal circumstances when i say pudding they think of that horrible chocolate paste stuff that i've no idea I why you call it is. chocolate pudding i don't know what that is it's like a sort of chocolate moussey type that i don't it's not know. even a mousse no I don't know it's what weird it is. it's weird but you now know that puddings to us are gorgeous sweet you know Desserts. confectionery type things like jam roly poly and yes, syrup yes. sponge well that for me says rhubarb crumble, crumble and oh, custard rhubarb crumble it does say that you're those colors right. the green yeah. and the red yeah. and then the sort of crunchy topping bit and oh my goodness you're absolutely right it's like yeah. so yes it may be festive and rabbit's christmas party flopsy mopsy and cotton tail. i know come on <laughs> did a connect connecting thing without even trying i know I mean, just gorgeous. That, it, it was so interesting to see a new dye technique as well. That yes. you've not shown before. With the double layering yes. of colour. Yeah, mm. it's going to be wonderful to mm. see how it turns out. Mm. And of course, there's the contrasting colour coming yes. in part two, which is going to be super exciting. It's very yummy. I'm yes. sat looking at it. Just perfect. So, for us to get there, we've got so much to get through. Oh, yes. <laughs> And the first thing that I need to say is, Kate Jones, what's off your needles? I finished something. Oh, I'm so pleased I finished it. Not that Brian... All ready for sixth form. All ready for sixth form. Perfect. She won't be wearing this till well into the autumn. But I finished Bryony's Owl Cowl. Oh, and I love it. Look. Perfect. Oh, how nice is that? It's gorgeous. It's all blocked and beautiful. The bl blocking, I think, especially on a cowl. Oh, it just like transforms it. Oh, don't you love all the blues? Bryony's favourite blue is this one here. It's called Marine. That's her favourite colour. Mine, actually, I love this really pale one down here. I think it's gorgeous. Oh, isn't it lovely? I'll pop it on just so you can see what it looks like. But I use Cascade Heritage for all of the blues. And then the brown is an Eden Cottage yarn in twig. But it's just the most perfect cowl. This is a free pattern, by the way, of mine. So you can go and make one of these yourself, the owl cowl. So it's a free pattern, just perfect cowl. I've got a couple of these and I wear them all, literally all the time in sort of autumn and winter. They're absolutely perfect. Do they match my buccaneer? Do you like my buccaneer? This is an old Tampa Bay Buccaneers kit thing. I'm very much in favour of Tom Brady this season because we think it'll be his last season so I'm just having a bit of support for the books. But they've always been a great team. Doug yeah. Williams, Steve yeah. Young, Steve DeBerg and... Any relation? Steve DeBerg. To Chris? Oh, no, I doubt it. Oh. Although maybe he is. Maybe he is. Funnily enough, Steve DeBerg, another old quarterback. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. Maybe the Buccaneers have mm. had a bit of a thing mm. with mm. older quarterbacks. Mm. Gorgeous. Loving my Buccaneer. Yes, so our cow all finished, and that'll just go away now for Bryony for sixth form. It's just perfect. Yeah. And it'll really go, I think, with the vibe that she's looking she, to sort of. Yeah, yeah, she's really sweet. She's because they don't, obviously, now she's out of a uniform. She can wear her own clothes in sixth form, and she's made a list. She's made a list of all the clothes that she wants. You've got to be organised. Um, yeah, for six form, which is brilliant. So we will get her sorted and all ready for September. But yeah, that's all finished. And of course, we couldn't just throw away her uniform. Oh no, no, no. So her uniform, um, she's got a blazer, she's got shirts, trousers, and she's also got a PE kit. I'm going to make her um, a couple of bags for school, so like pencil cases and like makeup bags and things like that. Do so she's thrilled. Um, yeah, her old a blazer pocket. She's got a blazer pocket here, which has got the school logo, logo. on it. 
um, in like a badge so I'm going to take that off I'm going to unpick it and then the pocket I think I'll either put on the inside of the bag or on the outside you know for it to put things into it it'll be like a little stationary thing and then I'll you know I'll probably do a I'll do a makeup bag and I'll do a bigger sort of pencil case bag I think and then she'll always have a uniform won't she and I think then she'll just sort of accept the change she doesn't like getting rid of things and changing things but she's very glad not to wear it but she doesn't like throwing things away does she perfect yeah Right, folks, special little segment. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because one of the questions we've been asked the most, really, over the years is how we film the location filming that we do. And it, I don't quite know how it came about, but we finally got ourselves into a position where we could effectively film it and get the story across. So we created a 30-minute documentary, and that is available to watch right now for our Silver, Gold and Platinum Baker Bear patrons. We, though, always want to try and share as much as we can with you here as well. So I'm sorry it can't be the full 30 minutes. And patrons who've seen it already, actually, this is a special edit. So there's footage in this that I didn't put in that other edit. And it's actually, it's been edited in a completely different way. So I think even if you've watched it, I think you'll probably enjoy mm -hmm. watching this little seven minute special making of Walking the Wall. to a very special behind the scenes. So many of you have been asking how we put together walking the wall. Now, it's quite a long process, so I'm gonna break it down to its simplest possible points. The journey actually starts right here, sat behind my desk looking at the Ordnance Survey Maps website. But then we hit the books, and there's a lot of them. So I'll show you just a few. And you know, I've been passionate about this part of the world for years, so I do have a lot. This one is exceptional. This is Roman Britain and New History by Guy de la Bedoyer. This book, which I read years ago and I refer to all the time, Alistair Moffat, The Wall. This book has been phenomenal. But then also as well, would you believe, this is a Haynes Manual. Haynes Manual, Hadrian's Wall from Construction to World Heritage Site, Operations Manual on the front there. Today I'm actually working on, as you can see here, here's the OS Maps software that we use, and I've specifically planned in routes. So moving in on episode four, which is the one that I'm planning now, as you can see, that zooms us straight in to what we're gonna be doing. If you look here, there are, there's waypoints along the way. And these waypoints are the areas where I need to do specific things as we go around the route. That way I know when I get back here, whether I need to be taking a shot with my camera or whether I need to be getting a shot with Stuart the drone. The question is though, how do I know which drone shots or camera shots that I need? So it starts here with this blank page. And the one thing I didn't really cover earlier on in this making of is how I go about populating this page. Well, it all comes from up here. <laughs> I use the information which I've read in the books, which I showed you earlier on, my personal knowledge of the site that we're visiting. And then I physically, using that OS Maps route that I showed you earlier on, I walk the route in my head. And along the route, I tell the story which we want to tell in this particular episode. So what happens is this blank page becomes this fully populated page. 
So I literally, you know, start with shot one, work all the way through and I'm typing in, okay, now I think we need a drone shot. Now I think we need a GoPro shot and so on. What this does is it tells me what shot I need and when I need it. So if we take a look at this drone shot here, that drone shot is this one that you're looking at now. That's how we get the footage, but that really is just the start of the process. Because once the footage has been captured, it's time to edit the show itself. So if we look on this shot list, if we look here, it says Housestead's Car Park, and then we've got shot 23. Here we go, I'm talking. So we know that that's shot 23. You may wonder why I do those claps. The reason being is that's how we sync the audio to the video. Now the audio I record separately. That way it makes sure that we always get a really good sound. What we have is we have some presets and I'm not gonna bore you with these because it really is starting to get nerdy. Do you see here it says Bakery Bears Audio, Show Audio. I'm gonna drop that in and immediately it's gonna make everything sound better. We need to make the picture look better. And the way that we make the picture look better is we drop into the settings on the, on the picture. And if you look here, I've brought up, I think it's called a Lumascope. It sounds like something the Ghostbusters use. And what I can do is I can, I can move up the exposure a little bit so I can make the, the, the shot a little bit brighter, but I can also come up here and I can make it slightly darker. And what I tend to do is I tend to just push the top bit so it's just peaking over 100 and I'm pushing the bottom bit just so it's slightly below zero. And when I do that, can you see how all these colors start to appear? So what I'm doing is I'm sort of opening up the exposure so that more of the colors then are there for you to see. Let's have a look at one of the drone shots. Here we go, I found it straight away. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna check the exposure. So again, we're gonna drop that down so it's slightly below the naught. We're gonna push that up so it's slightly above the 100. Do you see how the blues in the sky suddenly started to pop a lot more? But you'll notice something here. There's no sound. Now, I'm guessing most of you won't realize that the drone doesn't collect any audio. And the reason for that is that if it did, all you'd be hearing is Stuart's engine and that wouldn't make very interesting, would it? It wouldn't make very interesting listening. So what I have to do is for every drone shot that I take, I have to capture audio to go with that shot. So the edit is finally finished. There'll be some of you thinking, how long does it take for the whole show to be sort of created and then finished and then ready to publish? Well, it takes about 16 hours to write the show. It takes, a with travel time and walking, and film, it takes probably eight hours yeah, it takes eight hours to film it. And then it takes about another 16 hours to edit it. So that's how we put together Walking the Wall. I hope you enjoyed that little behind the scenes. My goodness, Kay was Isn't like that fun. She was. Oh, I loved it. You I was, had no idea, did you, about all the different? No, elements? no, no. I didn't have a clue how you did anything. And you know, if, if you get to watch the full thirty-minute one, then you'll see it's just. You just think, oh, gosh, I don't know. Because, I mean, I obviously live here with Dan and, you know, I, I see him go off and do these days and then he'll come back. And, you know, most times he's kind of exhausted and the next day you're even kind of a bit jaded, aren't you? It takes you a couple of days to, to sort of get past the sheer energy that's needed, really, to film these things. And I think that definitely comes across when you see just the amount of work. And it's the stopping and the starting and the setting of the camera and then moving it and then doing a drone shot and then moving the camera again. And then, oh no, I've got to say that again, that wasn't quite right, I'll go back and do it. And oh, it's, yeah. a, it's a labor of love. You know, yeah. I, I love every element of it. And yeah. I've looked into the, the, the way that things are made and this is how 
a normal TV show is made. Mm. So, you know, this is a standard normal length of time. This is not long, it's not short, it's how long you would expect. I mean, in fact, there's some TV shows which take substantially longer oh, yeah, for the same amount of runtime. Yeah. And I think that the hardest element to it is, like Kay said, it's the fact that you have to be able to very quickly take off the presenter hat mm. and then very quickly put on the, the cameraman hat or the drone pilot hat or the director mm. hat. Because if you don't do those things, things if you don't sort of compartmentalize each one of those jobs then it's really easy to get confused as, as to w- yeah w- but, what is going on and, but the thing with like a normal oh, i say normal okay the thing with the show on the tv is it's not just one person no, no. that does it it's all a different people you've got a cameraman you've got a sound man yeah. you've got someone that's operating the drone and all yeah. that you would be doing as tony robinson for example is just presenting it you yeah. know you wouldn't be doing all of the other things as well and you're doing all of those things so i mean it is amazing would create a very difficult conundrum for me because I think that I enjoy the production side of it as much as I enjoy the presenting side of it and so it would be difficult to know what I could release well this is like me and designing in a way because I've often thought and I know a lot of designers out there they will use sample knitters so they will you know the designer themselves would just sort of do swatches but then they would employ sample knitters and a number of times I've thought gosh you know I would get through a lot more designs if I did that but I just I can't release that bit of the process because I just need to know what it's like to knit that thing. Well, it's a vitally important part of the process. I think it yeah, is. Yeah, you know, yeah. I need to experience myself to you know to to create that thing and know you know was it nice to knit? Yeah, Did yeah. I have any problems? Well, you know, because that's not necessarily something you would get back from a sample knitter yeah. because everybody experiences things in a different way. But so I do was, understand that it's difficult yeah. to yeah, let yeah. go. That was a little snippet of the making of Walk in the Wall. And if you want to see the full show, the full 30 minutes, and that full 30 minutes includes, I know loads of you want to know how, do you know when I do those walk pasts where it goes beautifully from one shot to another with a drone and then maybe going over a style and all of that. I take you through step by step exactly how those are pulled Mm. together in the full version of the show. So it's definitely worth a watch. Look. We've got some dying to get back to. Oh, yes. yes. Because it's time for us to create the perfect contrasting colour. Welcome back, everybody, to my favourite colourways. Very exciting. We've dyed up our main skein our rabbit's Christmas party and we are now going to dye up that coordinating skein. So I'm going to be dyeing up a full skein, I'm not going to be doing minis in this instance, I'll just do a full skein of yarn um, and then you know if you want to do that you can or you can do minis, it's entirely up to you. So let's crack on and dye up that skein. Right, so we are ready now to dye up our coordinating skein. So let's see what happens. I'm just gonna go for it. So I'm gonna use the plum and I'm gonna use the cherry red and I'm gonna put the dye into the pot and then we'll put the yarn in and we'll we'll see what happens. I think I'm gonna go for, let's try a half of an eighth of each of the colours and just see what that looks like and then we can always add more. So a half of an eighth of each of the two colours. Can you see, I don't know if you can see, but the cherry red, can you see how it's clumped on the surface here? I find that it doesn't want to dissolve in as easily as the other colours. So we're going to give it a good stir to make sure that We've got rid of as many of those clumps as we can. It's a lovely colour in the pot. Let's have a look. Mm, It needs to be darker than that, I can tell. So I'll do another half of an eighth of each of the colours. So I will have put in here basically an eighth of a teaspoon of each of the two colours and we'll see where that gets us. So give it a good old stir. It looks like Ribena currently. Mm, maybe, maybe it's too red for Ribena. Not sure. Okay. Let's just leave that and let's see. You see, I can. Can you see all those lumps of colour? That's the 
Blooming Cherry Red. I think this is why I just never used this colour very much. Because I just found it really not well behaved at all. I'm going to put the yarn in and if we get little spots, you know, where we've got more intense colour of that cherry then it's fine, isn't it? So let's grab our full skein. So it's one full skein. Let's give that a little squidge. So let's just plonk it in. Ooh, that's nice. Nice colour. So let's just, as it goes in, just push it around. Oh, it's a lovely colour. So that's all in. So now what I'll do is I'll lift it up and move it. Because inevitably the bit you put in first gets a more concentrated amount of dye. I'm just kind of remembering what that main skein looks like in my head. And you can see we've got a lot of variegation of colour here actually. This bit is definitely darker than this bit. So I mean that's nice. I don't want it to be super dark because our main skein does have some undyed areas in it. I just want a sort of lovely, like berry juice maybe? And I think that's about right, isn't it, for berry juice? What do you think? It's a lovely colour. I think that's about right. I think I'm going to go with that. So I'm just going to, it's already really steamy, the water you can see there. I'm just going to raise the temperature like I did before. As soon as that's simmering, I will pop it outside with the other skein to cool off. Okay, so we're ready to rinse our yarn now. So I'll bring the pots over. I'm going to do the main skein first. And... I always find with that cherry red, because I just have issues with that particular dye, there's always a little bit of, you know, it looks pale, pale pink in there. Because it just, I just find that you get floaty bits that don't absorb in. So yeah, I've got my yarn here, I'm just going to drop it into my water. This is just some warm water that I've got a little bit of wool wash in there with. And we're just going to give it a nice little swish around. And this will get rid of those extra little bits of that particular <laughs> cherry red. It's worth persevering with that colour though because it is a really nice shade. It's really, it's essentially clear. It's pretty good actually. We just had that bit left in the pot. But that's looking clear, which is good. But we know from the clear water here that that's a good set of colour. So, squish. That, oh, doesn't it look lovely? Oh, it looks like... I don't know, just curled round like that. It looks almost edible, doesn't it? Beautiful. That It is as I remember it, that colourway, so that's really good. So here's the coordinating skein. Looks lovely. Gorgeous colour. Ooh. So let's just drop that in. And again, tiny bit of pink in the water there, in the dye water. But this is looking clear again. That's lovely and clear. So again, we know that that's a good set of dye. So we can now, oh, they look lovely together, don't they? We can now pop those outside to dry. Okay, so our yarn is now dry and it's, it's lovely. It is, I should say, it looks as I remember it. So that's good. So we've got the two lovely skeins of the Rabbit's Christmas Party and then one of this gorgeous sort of, it has come out more pink than I expected it to come out actually. I did think it would be more plummy because there's more plum in there than there is um, that cherry red. Um, but it's obviously just a very powerful colour, colour the cherry. In any case, I think it's lovely. It, you know, it's pink. What is what's not to like <laughs> so here's our coordinating skein so we just need now to skein these up so I'll just do one of the main skeins so as usual I'm just going to take it off the little locky uh, thing I can never remember the name of cable tie and let's have a little look how many ties have we got 
There's the one that's holding everything together and there's three more but look we've got there's one down here at the bottom and two in the middle so I'm going to snip off the two that are in the middle and you know obviously always leave the one that you can see is holding the skein together there's usually four strands coming off that so I'm going to take off these two in the middle I just don't when it's in a skein you know in your own yarn stash there's no need for it to have all of those ties on, I don't think. And also, it looks prettier in the skein if there's not as many ties. So, give it a little shifty. Looks good. And then we can give it a wind. Seven, as usual, I think. Oh, it looks really nice. I'm looking forward to knitting this up. As I said before, I've I've never knit with this colourway, so what I'm going to do, in fact, I'll talk about that down, when we're downstairs, just having a, a last little chat. I'll talk about what I'm going to do. But, oh, it looks lovely. So I will now just skein up the other two and then we can take a closer look. Rabbit's Christmas party. I really love how it looks in the skein. I can't wait to knit it up. And there's our coordinating pink. Now what you could do, if pink isn't your favourite colour, you could pick out the green instead and I would do the same thing. I would use the two greens that we used and just do exactly the same technique as we did with those two, you know, more berry colours. With the green if you wanted to, or you could you know, do the brown. We only used one brown, but you could certainly use that. Or you could do what I did with the original ones that I sold, and I did a completely different colour that related to something else within that little story. And I did that sort of, it's um, the colour I used actually, I remember it's gunmetal from Jacquard, and it is like a very metally coloured grey, very blue grey. So you could always do that as well. There's lots of different options, but of course, where possible, I'm always going to go for the pink option, aren't I? Because I'm a pink girl. Really lovely. I'm super pleased with it and I can't wait to knit it up. Now, what I'm going to do, because I haven't actually knit with this before, previously when I've been working my wrist ticklers, I think I've either had some of that colourway in my stash or, you know, I'd already knit it. Or there's been something where I could actually show you the wrist tickler with that colourway knit into it. Now, I've not obviously had a chance to do that yet because I've only just dyed it, but... What I'm going to do is I will knit that next section over the next couple of days and then I will show you it within the show. So you will see it knit up, just not here at this second. It'll be in about a minute or two or something like that and you will see it knit up within this wrist tickler. I'll just show you the wrist ticklers just to remind you. This is the first one all done with the first three colours that we did. And they just, it's a free pattern this, and they just slip over your wrist, keep you warm. In the winter, you can pull them right up if you want to. I've got two pairs of these, I think. I wear them all the time in the winter. They're brilliant because they keep your hand warm, but, you know, my your fingers are still free to sort of, you know, if I want to stop my audiobook or whatever. So that was the first one. Of the first three colours, we did Hubba Bubba, just Stab Magic and Hobbit Land. And then the last one that we've just did was Sirius, and that's that one. So Sirius now will be followed by the Rabbit's Christmas Party, so that'll be sweet. It's turning out, actually, that this mitt is kind of all speckledy ones, although this one is gonna be, it's not really speckled, but it will come out as a, mm, it's not really variegated. It, it is more of a speckled, I would say. Whereas this one is more kind of stronger colours. So that's really fun. So yeah, I'm gonna have great fun 
knitting that up. I imagine I will do it in about three seconds because I can't wait to see what it looks like. And like I said, I will show you that shortly. So there we go. That's our gorgeous rabbit's Christmas party. I hope you really enjoy dyeing that up if you give it a go yourself. So have fun dyeing up your yarns and I will see you back very soon for more My Favourite Colourways. Perfect. Oh yes. I mean, just lovely. Two really sort of contrasting, mm. but beautifully sort of together mm. colours. Mm. And oh my goodness, the things that you could make with those. I mean, I do think it does... Ooh, the socks, definitely. You see, part of me thinks socks in the contrast... Sorry, yeah, socks in the second colour yeah. with contrast with the first colour. Yeah, I have, I have seen people do that to do switch it, do it the opposite way around. So do cuffs, heels and toes in the variegated yeah. and do the rest in the solid. I think that's think really cool. That would just be really You could cool. actually make two pairs of socks with the two skeins, couldn't yeah, you? Yeah. Oppositize. You could. Oppositize. And a word. Another new word. Summer festive merriment and oppositize <laughs> and tight. You're learning so much today. You are, aren't yes. you? So another My Favourite Colourways is finished, but Kay here yeah. has got you some wonderful examples of the yes. yarn that she's just created. So here are the two skeins, or oh, this is one of them. I've actually been using the other one. Oh, aren't they lovely? I think they're just like, but like Dan said, they, they're not overly festive at all. I think you could use this really any time of year and it, it wouldn't look particularly overly Christmassy. Um, and that's it caked up. That's the other one that I caked up. So I did knit it into my wrist tickler and it gets a lovely sort of variegated Gorgeous. look. Gorgeous. So I've only got one more section to go and I'll have a pair of wrist ticklers. But, but there will be more. There will. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, so I'll have to start something a, do else. A, do a foot fiddler. <laughs> <laughs> What would a foot fiddler be? That just sounds wrong. It sounds completely wrong. <laughs> I'll take that back. Okay. So yeah, here's my lovely wrist tickler with it knit into. And this is 64 stitches on 2.25 millimetre. So it gives you an idea on how that knits up. I did something else with it that I've wanted to do for ages, right? For oh, ages and ages, I've wanted to know how big of a granny square I could make with a 20 gram mini. Because I think I've all, I think this would be a great project for advent, yarn advents, or just minis that you've got in your stash, you know. And I was just curious, I thought I just need to know how big of a granny square will get, you know, 20 grams will get me. So I did it, I wound off exactly 20 grams, I weighed it, and I know that generally a mini skein weighs a tiny bit heavier. I just know that from, you know, dyeing them. They're usually sort of 21-ish grams, so they do normally weigh a tiny bit heavier, but I thought I'll just wind off exactly 20 grams, so I did that. And I made myself a lovely granny square, and I just love how this crochets up. It's amazing the difference between knitting and crochet. So you can often find, if for example you've got a fingering weight yarn and it, you're knitting it in a sock and you think, don't, I'm not keen on that, the way that it's knitting up. And you, if you are a crocheter, crochet it instead and it knits up totally different. Oh, I just love it. How lovely is that? It looks quite autumnal to me. So you know, it does have a festive sort of look, but I think it also looks quite autumnal. Perfect. So I used a three millimetre hook. I mean, this will be different for everyone. But I used a three millimetre hook and I got 13 rounds and I left the yarn attached. I had this much left. So it really was every last bit. Now, I've, I don't know if I've got an issue with it being a 13 round square. I'm not superstitious in the slightest. So I don't know why this should even bother me. But the fact that I only had this, but like I said, it was bang on 20 grams. So I'm thinking, I could pro I'd probably be okay with other minis. But I just wanted to show you really, and it gets me about a seven inch square. And I think that's such a lovely size. I did this within a day, but I, I couldn't do it all at once. It's quite a lot of crocheting, for me it is, because I have to be careful. But I stopped and started with it, 
you know, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. And by the end of the day, I'd got a square. And I love this particular granny square that I use. I have done a tutorial for this, but it's created in such a way that you don't get that skew that you can sometimes get with granny squares. It's This hasn't been blocked and it's just lovely and square. So I really love doing that and that might be a, a project for advent minis to do granny squares and then ultimately make them into a blanket. Cool! So that's the end of another gorgeous My Favourite Colourways. It'll be back in a few weeks. Next time though, we're back perfectly really after watching the making of Walk in the Wall. We're back for another Walk in the Wall. Yes. And it's going to be an absolute corker. There's some Hollywood connections baby and I can't oh, wait yes. to show you. Now though, it's time for the Andy Bits. Andy Bits. We've already mentioned the Christmas in July, Kel. Yes. The shining jewel in yep. our summer of stitching. It is. But it's one of two shining jewels. Yes. Because on the 5th of July, Kay's Stitchy You begins. It does. If you want to find out how to create this absolutely amazing hand embroidery. Yeah. And you can be an absolute total beginner. I was. Yes. And <laughs> still kind of am. She's going to yeah, take you look, through if every I can stage. Do, if I can do it, you can do it. You know, and I loved it. And I've got another one of these that I created when I did the, the you know, filming of it that I'm also going to make into a bag as well at some point. I think I'm going to put it into a Christmas style bag. But yeah, that's the lovely mushroom house that you can create during Stitchy You. So this really, it, it's the big sort of thing for our summer that we've yes. been working on so much through we the start have. of this we year. Have. We've used some new filming techniques for yep, the tutorials and it's just been so much fun to do. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I, I just know, I know that you guys are going to enjoy it. I know loads of people are really, really excited about yes. this. Yes, yes. We do though, right the way through the rest of our Stitcher You, and in fact permanently now as well, I mentioned this a few times, but we've got our binge-worthy box sets that are coming out. So that's every other, it's every second Sunday in the month, basically a whole series. It might be a whole knitting tutorial series or a whole crochet tutorial series that there it drops for you and you can watch yeah. it. You know, we all love to binge watch things now, you know, we on do, Netflix and, um, and also on Amazon Prime. So they're coming as well. Also, too, we have our next wonderful issue of Knitability. Yes. I mean, I literally gasped when I opened it up when Jen sent it through. Which is fabulous. The front she? cover blew my mind. It's just tremendous. And it's coming out on the 4th of July. 4th of July. So if you're celebrating on the 4th Ooh. of July, what better way? Just take a few minutes. Yeah. When you need a bit of a relax. <laughs> From your festivities. Download oh. Knitability and have a little read. Because yes. my goodness, it's got some treats in there. It's Bryony's prom on the 4th of July as well. Yes. Speaking of treats, you bought some fabric. Yes, I did. I saw this, I can't remember where actually, but I just loved it. I love Halloween. I'm not mad on Halloween itself, but I love the kind of aesthetic and the feel of Halloween. You might be mad on Halloween this year. Oh, Yes. Something might happen on Halloween this year. Something like, like... Maybe you should mark it in your diaries. You should definitely mark Halloween in your diaries. Our patrons know why. I've already told them a secret. But yes. So show us your fabric. Halloween. Yeah, so I saw this little group of fabrics and I thought, oh, I just love that. So I ordered a fat quarter of each. You can get fat quarters like in little sets, can't you? And it's by Camelot. Camelot Fabrics. And the range is called Hey Boo. Oh. And it just, we call Bryony Boo, or I call Bryony Boo. You don't so much, do you? But I call her Boo all the time. So quite often I'll go, hey, Boo. So it just made me think of her. And it's all these Halloweens, but it's all peaches and pinks. I mean, I'm all over that. So I'll just show you quickly each of the fabrics. Look, it says Boo. There's that one. And then there's, Bryony loves this one because the little ghost is saying, creep it real, which she really likes. And then there's pumpkins fabulous this is my favorite well it's one of my favorites actually look eyeballs on black i love that and then eyeballs on peach and then you've got a pink version of that one and a pink version of the ghosties gorgeous so i'm gonna do something with those i expect it'll be a bag of some description but i just really love them so i wanted to show you in case you wanted them that's it. So please come and join our Christmas in July camp. Yes. Open to the world. Oh yes. It's going to be just marvellous with amazing, with, I mean the prize is just perfect. 
I hope so. I mean, I that. yeah, I loved working with them. So yes. hope you, whoever wins them enjoys them as well. Yeah. yeah, don't miss the start of our Stitch You on the yep. fifth. Yeah. Also, as well, the making of Walking Walls available for you to watch right now, and we'll see you in two weeks. Yes. For the return of the Baker Bears video show featuring Walking the Wall. Amazing. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye. Take you to fabulous places of which their favorites they'll share. You better buy a pad and get yourself a bakery bear. You'll find yourself in a castle watching the bakery bears. It never feels like a hassle to sit and watch the bakery bears. What's on your shelf or what?